The following is a presentation of Nachi Creek Baptist Church in Madisonville, Tennessee. For more information, please visit nachicreekbaptist.org.
sing this song together. Congregation, you know it. Let's just sing it together. chapter 24. I think we're to teach our children and nurture them in the admiration of the Lord. Notchie Creek has a youth that is a vital, as I said a moment, part of our church. And I want you to think about it, Notchie Creek. When you get to thinking about our young people, and maybe some of you don't care much about young folks doing things, you take our young folks out of our church and see what we've got. I appreciate them. Thank God for them. Thank God for you senior adults to hang in here with us. We, we'll do things with them, and thank God for you just staying with us. Are you at Luke 24 yet? It says, now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning they came to the sepulchre, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away. Reckon how that stone got rolled away. Anybody got an idea this morning? Well, I, I, I know how it got rolled away. The Bible says, and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, the Bible says, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth. They said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is what? Raised. Amen. Remember how that he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of what kind of men? Sinful men. And be what? Crucified. And the third day rise again. And the Bible says, and they remembered his words. 
I want to talk to you this morning from the words of Jesus, okay? I want to talk to you about what his words uh, mean and, and what he spoke whenever he was on the cross. Now, folks, he would spoke, the Bible says he spoke to Lazarus, Lazarus came out. The Bible says he would, uh, he would stand to a congregation, he would speak, and they were all amazed at his words. And all through his ministry, he kept attention. I don't think, well, maybe somebody got a little sleepy, but I don't believe there's anybody maybe went to sleep on Jesus preaching. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, what he said, the Bible says that his words were lost. And I believe this morning there's still life to those that will receive thee. And the Bible's telling us that the word says here that they remembered his words. Now, I'm going to just flip back to Luke chapter 23, and I'm going to show you the words of Jesus from the cross. And I believe those words this morning uh, will, uh, will still cast a shadow upon us today. I believe there are words that you and I, as we read the Bible, as we're children of God, I believe that we can take uh, from the Word of God and still believe that it's as powerful as the day whenever Jesus spoke those words. The Word of God says in Luke chapter 23, I'll pick up the reading, in verse number 33, and when they were come to the place which was called Calvary. Now in the King James Version, the word Calvary if this is the only place that it appears, the other references was uh, the, the place of the skulls, or it meant Golgotha. And if you've ever been to Jerusalem, you'll know outside the uh, city of Jerusalem, up on the, the Calvary's mountain, uh, there is a uh, skull-like uh, figure in the side of that mountain, two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. And on top of that mountain, they crucified the very Son of God. And it's called uh, Golgotha, or the place of the skull. And the Bible says there they took Jesus on that mountain at Calvary, and they crucified him, a male factor, one on the right and one on the left. And let's see the words of Jesus. The first thing he said was this, Then said Jesus, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. What was the words from the cross? I believe the words was a regeneration. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, there's still power in the blood of Christ. I still believe that the Bible says that we can be regenerated, as Jesus told Nicodemus. Uh, as he uh, was uh, speaking to Nicodemus, he said, Nicodemus, verily, verily, I send to you, you must be born again. And that term, born again, Literally comes from the phrase, and it means regeneration. I'm grateful that I've been regenerated. I've been born again by the blood of Jesus. Hey, folks, without other crucifixion, without Jesus going to the cross, dying on the cross, uh, and the Bible says, raise the third and appointing morning, hey, folks, there'd be no power uh, in regeneration. Nobody can be changed. But I'm grateful to share with you this morning, Notchie Creek. I'm grateful that Jesus changed my old wretched soul. I'm grateful that he regenerated my life. He gave me a new birth. And folks, because of that new birth, thank God, I've become a new creature in Christ Jesus. The first thing he said, oh, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You say, preacher, has this world got any better? Hey, folks, we're as bad off as they were. In those days, we're still sinful men. We still need to be regenerated. This world needs to still receive Christ as his Savior. And folks, and be born again by the Spirit of God. The Bible says that Jesus called out, Father, forgive them. Aren't you grateful that we've got an adversary before God this morning? we got someone that's calling our name. Someone is saying, there's forgiveness in the name of Jesus. The Bible says, number two, let's hurry on. Oh, Luke chapter 23, I'm picking up the reading. In verse number 43, the word of God says, And Jesus said unto him, there's those words again, 
You see, they remembered what Jesus had said. I, I, I'd encourage you this morning to write down these words. Uh, there's a word for uh, being regenerated to forgive you of your sins. Not only that, but the Bible says, Jesus says in verse 43, And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Hey, I'm grateful that he spoke of the resurrection. I'm grateful when Jesus was on the cross, oh, one thief on the right and one thief on the left. And the Bible says, One said to him, If thou be the Son of God, Oh, why don't you just come off the cross and take us with you? And the other one says, listen, we're here because of our sins. We're here because of our deeds. Uh, but this man has done nothing to miss. He said, Lord, would you remember me when you come into thy kingdom? And Jesus said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. I'm grateful to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, our loved ones, when they die, uh, believing in Jesus, receive Jesus as their Savior, knowing him in the free pardon of sin. I'm grateful to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, they'll arise again someday in the resurrection. We're thinking about the resurrection. I just want you to know, folks, uh, some of us, we're living in modern days, 2013. Uh, we're living uh, in, in days that people are denying the Bible. I've heard a lot about the Bible this week. Some of you have been watching it on TV, and people have been talking about it. I've heard uh, news commentators there's talking about it, and they're talking about the Old, uh, uh, the old Testament don't mean anything. It's just paragorically uh, talking about all these things. Uh, they're saying uh, things about uh, the New Testament. They were just figures of speech and all these things. I understand I just believe one of these days every knee is going to bow before God. I believe every tongue will confess, ladies and gentlemen, that Genesis through Revelation is the infallible, uh, inerrant Word of God. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that God's Word shall stand when this world is burning. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, you say, preacher, uh, folks, you've got a narrow view. I tell you, folks, uh, I'm grateful that I've got that narrow view. Why? Because I believe what God's Word says. I believe, folks, it's a lie today. And I believe the Bible says uh, that forever that I can hide in my heart and it'll cleanse me from all my sins. Aren't you grateful it'll do the same for you? Aren't you grateful that God's Word, uh, folks, is true today? Hey, I'm grateful that he spoke of the resurrection on the cross of Calvary. Let's see what number three that he did. The word of God says in John chapter 19, I've got my mark, so you just follow with me. They'll get it on the, the board here in a minute. Verse 26, and Jesus says in verse 26 and 27, And when Jesus therefore saw his mother, and the disciples standing by, now this is John, whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then said he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own house. You see, Jesus had words of remittance. He remitted. He, 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 cast, he took and told John, said, Listen, I'm going to place my mother in your care. And the word of God says that uh, John took your, some of the scholars say that probably Joseph had already died. But you see, while he was on the cross, I want you to listen to me. When he was on the cross, he was still concerned about his mother. He was still concerned about that virgin that brought him into this world. But I want you to understand this, ladies and gentlemen. And I, I don't like, I don't, I pray, I just, I don't like, uh, let me just say it, let me just be blunt about it. Mary was a good woman. She gave him birth, but she's not the one that can forgive my sins. She's not the one that I look to. Hey, folks, he, he remitted her uh, to the keeping of John. Hey, folks, he was concerned about her. But lesson, ladies and gentlemen, he was more concerned, or he's concerned about the sins of the world. The Bible tells us that Jesus, hey, folks, he, he had an earthly family. He had brothers, and he had sisters, and he had a father, earthly father, and he had a mom. But the Bible says that whatever he was on the cross, 
He still wanted mom tucking kids off. Aren't you grateful that he's a personal Savior? Aren't you grateful that he has a personal, you're one of his. If you're one of his children, you're a believer, you're one of his. And you may not believe this, folks, but he knows who you are, where you are, and he knows the care that he wants you to have. This world don't care nothing about you. Satan don't care nothing about you. Hey, listen, the devil don't have, he don't have any good things for you. Listen, young people. All, and I, I've got some old folks here who testify. All Satan wants to do is destroy your youth. He wants to destroy anything about you. He don't want you to grow up and, and be a follower of Christ. He don't want you to follow Jesus while you're uh, in the youth department. He don't want you to be a, a beacon, a shining light at your school. He don't want you to be that. He just wants you to be maybe in the youth group but kind of keep your mouth shut. He don't want you to exalt the Lord Jesus. He don't want you to pass out a track. He don't want you to testify. Listen, I, I believe, folks, that Satan is trying to destroy a Christian nation as America. He's trying to destroy it through the influence of our youth. Can I get an amen there? Y'all believe that? I believe he attacks. Now, he still stays on me. He attacks me. Some of you older folks will agree he attacks you. But I want you to know, I, I've noticed it from generation to generation. He's always after the youth. In my day, he was after the youth through music. What about your day? Was the after the youth through music? Now, I was raised in the late, well, I was in the 60s. I was a 50s, 60s, and 70s guy, okay? Now, I remember when the Beatles come to town. Any of you older folks here remember when the Beatles come to, to America? And uh, I, I remember when Elvis Presley went to the army. I remember the day they come and told us President Kennedy got killed. I remember those days. And I remember in the late 70s, the war was going on in Vietnam. We got, we got guys that's been in the war here. And in the war in Vietnam, we, uh, we had music. And they, my daddy and my forefathers called it that long-haired music. Amen. And you know what's happened to that generation that had the long hair? It's all fell out by now. <laughs> or turned gray. They don't got much of it anymore. But my daddy would call it that long-haired music. And our old folks would call it the long... And folks, you say, well, it don't affect... Hey, folks, Satan is working through music in America today to destroy our youth. If you can understand it, you can understand the lyrics. It will scare you what Satan put in the mind of our young people. I can't understand it. If it's, if it's got music to it, it my, my ears has got to the point. It all just runs together, and all I see is them nodding their head. <laughs> and the beat goes on, amen. They got these headsets on. I'm talking about ears this big around. They got it over that head, and... And it don't make no difference how much you holler. I've got to the point anymore, I have to text my kids to get their attention. I can't get their attention because I'm hollering at them because they've got their earmuffs on with a plug in, and they're going like that all the time. Satan's always out trying to destroy. Hey, folks, he's trying to destroy not your creek you. He's trying to destroy our youth uh, through our world today. But I'm praying that God will raise up some youth. Jesus cares about you this morning. He cared enough on the cross how to be concerned about his mother. Now let's move on. I got hung up on that a little bit. I, I'm not going to apologize. You needed that. Amen. Matthew 27, verse 46. The Word of God says this. It says, and about the night there, Jesus cried with a loud voice. Eli, Eli, Lamessa, Sabathana. He says, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You see, Jesus spoke of regeneration. Jesus spoke of resurrection. 
and Jesus spoke of remittance. But we find in this verse of Scripture, we find the fourth thing that he said. Uh, folks, we find that he says, I have been rejected of my Father. How many of you have all ever been rejected of your Father? You say, Preacher, have you ever been rejected? Not really. But my dad was one of the greatest dads in the world. You know why? When he told me I was going to get a whipping, I got it. And the bad thing that I didn't like about my daddy, he would make me go get the peach tree limb myself and give it to him. And when he got wore out, then I had to take and throw it away. My daddy was one of these guys that, listen, he didn't say, son, I want you to do this and I want you to do that. When he came in in the afternoon, if it hadn't been done, folks, he got my attention. I never will forget. You know, kids get cocky. Do you all have cocky family members? Teenagers, they get cocky. I, I was the only one graduated out of six boys. I'm the only one who graduated high school. And I got out of high school and I graduated in 1970. I, I worked and I got out of high school and, and uh, I, I went, to, got me a job. I, some friends of mine got me a job in Chattanooga. And I said to my daddy, I said, Daddy, I'll tell you what. We was talking. I went in and I started packing my clothes and I said to my daddy, uh, he had been pretty rough on me. He told me when to get home. And you know, I had to come home at that time. And he told me what to do. Listen, I was 18 year old and my daddy was still telling me what to do. And, and you know what, Josh? I just got tired of it. And I got me a job in Chattanooga. And I come in one day and I said, I've got me a job in Chattanooga. And I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to pack my clothes and I'm going to Chattanooga. Daddy, and I'm going to get up from your rules. And you know what my daddy did? Oh, gosh. He got the suitcase out. Now you talk about pulling the wind out of you. There he was, and I went to Chattanooga, and I lived uh, in a trailer. Nothing wrong with living in a trailer, but I lived in a trailer with three other boys. And boy, there's something wrong with living in a trailer with three other boys. Now we lived in that trailer, and I, I lived down there about six months, and I, I finally, I'm going to use this term, I'm just a country preacher, I tucked my tail between my legs. And after a while, I came back to my father's house, and I said, Daddy, Mama, i tell you what I'll do. If you'll let me come back, I'll pay your rent. <laughs> Best thing my daddy ever got, he, he got rid of me. I was munching off of me. He sent me out. I come back, paid him rent to come back. Pretty good stuff, hey, man. But what happened to Jesus? He had been a good boy. He had never sinned. He'd done everything God asked him to do. But you know what God did? He had to turn his back upon his son. You know why, boys? You know why, girls? He placed all of my sin. He placed all of your sin. He placed the sin of the whole world upon that sacrifice. And God never looked upon sin. He turned away from him. And Jesus went to hell for you and I. He took my sins. You read the book of Peter. The Bible says that he bore in my body upon that old cross. He bore my sins. And the Bible says, ladies and gentlemen, that he did it all for me. Hey, folks, all my rottenness, all my sins was placed on that sin sacrifice. Oh, I could preach and go in the Old Testament. It's a beautiful picture of that scapegoat and all that. But I, I just want you to know, in my heart, in your heart, if you're saved this morning, you'll never have the Father to turn his back on you. And that ought to make you shout a little bit once in a while. 
I'll never have to worry about Jesus forsaking me because he said he'd never leave me nor forsake me. Let's go on. I'm going to give you something else and I'll be through. 19th chapter, I'm still there. 19th chapter of the book of John, I'm going. John chapter 19. If you're going with me, say amen. 19th chapter of John, I'll get there in a minute. The Bible says in verse 28, After this, Jesus, knowing that the, all things were accomplished, that what the Scriptures might be fulfilled, saith what? I thirst. You see, on that cross, he had a request. He was thirsty. They offered him. They offered him drugged vinegar. Before... Darkness came. Nine till twelve they crucified him between two thieves. They offered him vinegar that was drugged to take pain away. And Jesus refused it. But the Bible says after twelve, from twelve to three o'clock, the Bible tells us there was darkness. And the second time they come and offered Jesus that vinegar, it was drugged. And you know the reason that he took it? That he might put it in his mouth. Because he had two more things to say. He had cleared his throat where he could say this. Let's read them together. The Bible says in verse 30, When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is what? It's finished. Hey, folks, he had a life statement that he made upon his two parts of part number A. Is it is finished? What did he finish? John's Gospel, chapter 17, verse 4, Jesus said, I come to finish the work that my Father sent me to do. What was the work that he finished? It was God's A plan. Some folks say, well, you know, wonder why Jesus had to come. If Adam and Eve wouldn't have sinned in the garden, Jesus wouldn't have had to come. Hey, folks. It was God's plan that they, they, they was going to have to be redeemed. The Bible said before God ever made the heaven and earth, it was predestined that Jesus would die on a cross. God knew you and I. And you know the thing of it is, some of us turn, come to church, dress up on Sunday, and we come in and act like God don't know anything about us. But I want you to know he knows the thoughts of your heart. He knows the intent of your heart. And he knows your thoughts are far off. He knows all about you. You say, well, now I could change my mind. I could do this and I could do that. Yeah, but you see, God knows that. God knows all about us. And you know, we sometimes kind of put God in a box and we think God don't know these things and we, we, we've got pretense that God, we just got God at church, we got God here, we, we just let God in on secrets. Do you know there's nothing that's ever occurred to God? Do you know that? Have you ever had something occur to you? <laughs> you young folks will experience it. The good thing about getting old is this, fellas. When you go to bed at night, you wake up the next day in a new world. You, you forgot about all that's went on the day before. You just kind of wake up in a new world. And, you, and sometimes I learn things that I've learned years ago. I, I forgot things. We're human. But God's never forgot anything. God knows all things. Nothing has to ever occur to God. Nothing has ever surprised God. You have never shocked God. God knows all about us. How many? Now this is a pretty good head of hair. Right here. Yeah, you've got a pretty good head. And that hair, yeah, he's got, yeah, and boy's got a, Flip that. Now, I tell you, how far is God off? Anybody know? Where's God at? Well, 
We've got him off somewhere in the, the heavens somewhere. God is omnipresent with us here today. You know what? He knows ever higher, brother, on our head. Now you tell me that's not, that's not an omnipresent God. You say, well, preacher, I don't know what if I can gather that in. Well, join the club. I can't either. But God, that's who he is. It's finished. He finished the plan of salvation for you and I. When he cried out, it is finished. Now Luke chapter 23, the last thing he said, I'm through. Luke chapter 23, let's go to it. Luke chapter 23, I'm going to verse number 46. And the Bible says this in Luke 40, 23, 46, he says these words. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my what? Spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the what? The ghost. You see, from the cross, he released his spirit. How many of you all can lay down at night and say, Lord, I'm going to die. Here's my spirit. You can't do that. The Bible says, Jesus said in John 10, Sharon or someone, uh, Josh or somebody, one of you young folks or whoever's going to lead us in a song this morning, get you a song. No one is able to release that spirit. But on the cross when he said it's finished, he said, Father, to thy hands I commend my spirit. Now, if you've not been counting these, these are the seven sayings from the cross. And he released that spirit. And he went back to the Father. And you know what happened? He's sitting down at the right hand of God, making intercession for you and I this morning. Little boys and girls, old men and women, middle-aged folks you know what we can do we can come in the presence of a holy God I said it this morning three crosses down on the hill they was one on the right one on the left one of them was dying in his sins he refused to receive Christ and there was one that died on the right side and he died to his sins because he believed in Jesus. But the one in the middle was dying for our sins. Not only that, folks, but he's at the right hand of God this morning. He's making intercession. You know what he did? He, take the, he took that broken fellowship from the garden. And he took Calvary. And he took mankind and he bridged the gap that man might be able to come back into the presence of God. You know, the only one place in the Bible, Easter, is even mentioned, and it's in the book of Acts. It only mentions it one time. The Old Testament word for Easter was the Passover. They'd kill the lamb, get behind the door, put it on the doorpost, get in behind. They said, when I see the blood, I'll pass over. Jesus supplied the blood. You say, well, this is a bloody religion. You, you're talking about dying. You're talking about the cross and talking about all these things. Without the cross, the death, without the burial, the tomb, and without the resurrection... This world don't have any hope. It's through Christ this morning. That's the simple gospel. The good news that Jesus took man and God and reunited us back on the cross of Calvary. As we stand together this morning, I don't know what your need is. 
you're lost, you need to get resurrected. If you're out of the will of God, you, you need to come back and take up your cross and follow Jesus. If you're living for Jesus, you just can rejoice and be glad this morning because Jesus saved your soul. Easter, it's the time to remember. A little lady in Athens, Greece, told me these words. She said, in America, you all decorate, you all celebrate, you all go all the way for Christmas. She said, we, we recognize it, but we don't celebrate like you do. So we put all of our celebration on Easter, and I said, why do you do that? She said, because... Christmas, God became man. But because of Easter, man can become as God. He's our hope this morning.